Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering Edge 2016. Brought to you by IBM. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome back to theCUBE, everybody, the worldwide leader in live tech coverage. Jason Ponton is here, he's the editor-in-chief of the MIT Technology Review. Jason, welcome to theCUBE. It's a pleasure to be here. Good to see you, sorry, at the keynote this morning, I learned that you guys think about technology in centuries. <laughs> we, we, have a, we have a long viewpoint, because the magazine was founded in 1899, which makes it the world's oldest technology publication, and we like to think the most authoritative. So, and it's a great publication. I still get the print, and obviously do, do online. But when you think about long-term trends in, in technology, how do you approach it, and how is that different from other publications? Well, we've got a joke. When everyone asks me to do some predictions, I always say I'm going to be completely wrong, and in the long term, it's going to have a much bigger impact than I can possibly guess. What tends to happen in technology is in the short term, the changes are pretty difficult to anticipate, and it's often much more difficult. But in the long term, these changes are really disruptive. So it's hard to remember that even 10 years ago, when we had very simple smartphones, we weren't used to carrying around iPhones where every single part of our life is now mediated. So uh, if you imagine just 10 years ago how much the world has changed, we think the disruption can be, can be fairly extreme after you get beyond two years, five years, 10 years, and 100 years, civilizations become unrecognizable. Well, we all have our favorite dot-com stories, but mm -hmm. look back, it was probably understated at the yeah, time, wasn't that's it? True. Was it not, and the value creation? Well, we used to mock at the time, those of us who were cynical, the idea of the next, next big thing, or the dot-com era, but the companies that were founded there then, uh, which survived, like Google, like Amazon, have entirely transformed the way we think about very basic human activities like shopping or looking up information. Yeah, so in your keynote this morning, um, we, well, first of all, many have seen your TED talk. If you haven't, you, you Google Jason Pond and TED and, and check it out, it'd be 1.601. <laughs> million people. <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so congratulations on that. Now you attacked that topic in 2013. Yeah when we were all wondering, all this new technology wave, are we ever going to use it to apply uh, to solving bigger problems? But we've started, haven't we? So, the TED talk addressed why it was that Silicon Valley, in particular, was addressing small problems or fake problems. And three or four years ago, people were very animated by, by the smallness of apps. You know, even apps that were fairly useful, uh, like uh, Uber or Airbnb. And the question I asked in the TED talk is how are we going to feed the 9.6 billion people who will be alive in 2050? How will we provide them with clean water? And most difficult of all, how will we provide them the energy which the emerging world has a legitimate desire to have the same standard of living that we've had here in the West for a for hundred years? And I think in the three years since I've given the talk, there has been a kind of a, an emotional shift in technology circles, people want to take on big problems. Founders Fund, a, uh, a venture fund founded by Peter Thiel, one of the founders of PayPal, says you, you promised me flying cars and instead I got 140 characters. So I think there's a powerful desire to take on bigger problems, but the problem is that you know, technology is organized to, technology investing and technology entrepreneurialism is organized for fairly short time periods. Seven years, you're in, you're out, you make your billion. And really big problems take, well, going to the moon involved 400,000 people, 20,000 organizations, and its height around 5% of the US GDP. And going to the moon was quite easy. So if you think of something really big, like reducing energy so it's net zero with its carbon emissions, that's a civilizational challenge. That's like building the pyramids. And um, I think technology won't be able to do that alone. It'll require politics, it'll require social commitment, and it'll require ordinary people to say they care. Yeah, I, I wonder, because yeah. is the take the moonshot, or yeah. you know, we're at an IBM show. IBM over, yeah. over 100 years of innovating. You know, where do we get the massive effort 
and you know capital to make those big bets because you know there's not too many companies that can say oh we're going to put billions of dollars into yeah. the efforts uh, you know the, the old sandboxes uh, I grew up in New Jersey where Bell yeah. Labs is there it's no longer what it was there so so where can th that you know that great effort and innovation come from well Let's go and give due credit to IBM mm. for having created a whole range of technologies that did create our modern technological civilization. But it is probably true that over the last 15, 20 years, the great era of corporate research labs, where they were essentially liberated to do whatever they wanted, has been under assault. Even, I'm Sorry to say this on the IBM show. Even at IBM, there's been a desire to have a much stronger connection between profit uh, and research. But there are labs uh, still doing work. IBM's doing really important work in memory. Uh, at Baidu and Google, they're doing fundamental work uh, with artificial intelligence. And Microsoft is doing an incredibly daring bet around quantum computing. So you can find these, these oases of uh, of corporate research. But the truth is, these big projects probably take a, a political commitment. So if we want to make a big inroads about uh, carbon emissions, there'll probably have to be some kind of global agreement like there was at the COP21 show, uh, COP21 conference, to begin to reduce carbon emissions globally. So government involvement obviously is part of that. Yeah. What came out of Apollo? What was the sort of societal impact of Apollo? Well, so there's that wonderful Kennedy speech where he gives at Rice University and he says, why go at all? And even at the time he knew there would be a cynical, uh, a cynical interpretation that we were going because the Russians were there. But Kennedy says, um, why do we do these things? We do them because they're, they're hard. So going to Apollo did, going to the moon did a couple of things with Apollo. First, it was a grand statement of human adventure. Um, everyone who went to the moon, all the surviving astronauts, sort of created a new sense of the fragility of our Earth. But it also created a whole variety of technologies that we now take for granted. And not just the silly ones that everyone knows, like Velcro or the Biro. It created fundamental breakthroughs uh, in navigational technology, in the way operating systems work. It created a variety of operating system languages. So you can never predict what the benefits of these big projects are going to be. But every single time in history we've made these big bets, it's paid off in technologies that ordinary people have used as well. Thoughts on SpaceX? I love SpaceX. So I think in the beginning of space travel, it did require a kind of a governmental effort. Most of the people working for NASA had been uh, drafted from the Air Force, and it probably took an effort like that. But We've made about as much progress as we're going to make, and now we need to unleash the entrepreneurial power uh, of markets to do the next things. So um, between the Bezos Blue project and Elon's SpaceX project, we need to drive down the cost of putting things into space to the point where they're a fraction of what they are now. And then I think a whole bunch of interesting startups might arise. So I would infer from your comments um, in your TED Talk and other comments, that you're a proponent of a, a, a Mars shot, uh, as opposed to, and there's been some debate mm -hmm. uh, 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 regarding where do we put the resource? Yeah. Should we try to habitate the moon? It might be more productive for society if we do that. What's your take on think, Mars versus the moon? I think we did the moon. I think, we, <laughs> I think we've already been Check. to the moon. And Check. they've done that. Um, and human beings have always explored. You know, there is no record at all of Neanderthals ever leaving the bounds of Europe. And, but think about it, for hundreds of thousands of years, human beings did something really strange. They got to the edge of a body of water, and with no reason to believe there was anything out there, they got onto a tiny little boat, and they set out, because that was next. And what's next is Mars. A couple of years ago, we went to interview the, the slightly miserable guy whose job it is to plan the Mars mission. And he knows in his heart of hearts, we're not going anytime soon. He knows going to Mars would require a colossal investment of money. And there are some basic technology problems we, we haven't solved yet. Human beings would get cancer probably if they, if they went to Mars with all the solar radiation. So my deputy editor, a guy called Brian Bergstein said, why are you doing this? 
And this, this guy is approaching retirement. And he said, well, here's why. Because one day, 10, 15 years from now, someone's going to want to go. And they're going to say, didn't they plan that back in the, in the teens of the century? And they'll take down my plan. And someone will say, there it all is. That kind of heroism in the face of frustration, I find very, very appealing. Elon Musk says that he is going to be the first man to die on Mars, <laughs> which is a gloomy and morbid, but also kind of heroic vision of that Mars is next. You made a comment today in your keynote about uh, AI had a 30-year winter. And it's okay. true, right? AI, yeah. we used to, first of all, we were intrigued by it, and yeah. then we just sort of laughed at it, and then just ignored it for a decade, and yeah. now it's back in a big way. What, what kind of problems do you think we can solve with AI? There have been a couple of things in the last five years which have truly surprised me. One was gene editing, but the other is artificial intelligence. And what's amazing about the breakthrough in AI is it didn't come from a brand new technology. It came from a technique called deep learning, which had been explored, it had been proposed in the 60s. Uh, the algorithms had been written in the 1980s, and they didn't get anywhere. And for reasons that would make a lot of sense to IBM, we didn't have powerful enough computers, and we didn't have enough data. So the early deep learning programs, they stacked pattern recognition just three or four levels deep. You can't do much when you do that. But when you have gigantic data farms with thousands of servers yoked together, you can begin to build up layers a thousand deep. And really fundamental forms of intelligent activity suddenly become possible. Um, things like pattern recognition, seeing patterns in weather, in financial systems, driving, driverless cars, really weird things uh, start to happen that you wouldn't anticipate. Now, a word of caution is in order. The history of AI has always hit these moments of frustration. So there are going to be things that, that deep learning can't do. There are going to be things that deep learning is bad at. But at the moment, it is probably the most exciting era in computer science in, in decades. Mm. Jason, yeah. uh, in the keynote this morning, you spoke a little bit about the innovators under 35. I did. Uh, can you share with our audience a little bit about it, and maybe a couple of examples? Yeah, so for 16 years, Technology Review has identified 30 innovators under the age of 35 who we think are going to transform the world. Now, we've had some success during this. You'll recognize some of the names, uh, people like Mark Zuckerberg, like Larry and Sergey from Google. It's important to say that when we found them, they were, if not unknown, they weren't very known. Um, there have been other people who are perhaps less famous than the tech titans, but who have been tremendously influential in their way. Folks like J.B. Straubo, who's the actual technology genius uh, at Tesla, and Helen Greiner, who created the first commercial robots. Uh, here at The Edge, uh, tomorrow afternoon, we brought 12 of our, um, forgive me, nine of our uh, young innovators with us, and we're going to give the IBM audience a taste of the kind of thinking which these young people have in common. What they, what they all, what they all share, they're members essentially of uh, of an, uh, an attention deficit order. You know, they they can't focus on anything for very long, but when they do, they bring this kind of blinding attention to the thing while they're in the midst of it. And then they go on to do the next thing. And they are also all powerfully motivated by a desire to do good in the world. They don't mind getting rich as well, but, and some of them are at this point, but they were essentially motivated by the desire to solve a big problem. And that's very MIT-ish, and that's very MIT tech review-ish. Global security, yeah. um, I think of Stuxnet. You know, yeah. Again, government involvement, even though nobody will admit it. Um, global security and technology's ability to solve yeah. those problems. Well, I used to say that uh, no one would take seriously the idea of their internet security until there was a Pearl Harbor moment. And, but that happened with Stuxnet, right? Mm. Um, some unnamed nation states <laughs> essentially took down the national infrastructure of Iran and devastated their 
their nuclear program. Imagine how we would feel if the Iranians had done that to us. Um, at the same time, there have been really embarrassing uh, corporate leaks to Sony, and just recently, we've watched the Democratic National uh, Committee and a former Secretary of State, Colin Powell, have their, um, their emails hacked. So, I have to believe that after years of saying no one would care, and people still not caring after Stuxnet, the sheer social embarrassment for companies and individuals might be beginning to shift this just a little bit. I know this, that many CEOs now are regarded as one of their biggest liabilities. And they're looking to companies like, like IBM, like HP, like FireEye, to give them a, a measure of safety. But in the end, internet security only derives from us using these things with a modicum of, uh, of, of responsibility. There are some basic things we should all be doing, like not clicking on a pop-up when it says click on me, you know, to go and keep our system safe. Yeah, bad behavior trumps good technology That's right. every time, doesn't it? All right, we're, we have to leave it there, but I'll, I'll give you the last word. Sounds like you're doing some really interesting things at Edge, and, but what's new for you guys? What should we look for? Well, the thing which I am most interested in writing about at the moment is this idea of gene editing. It's a technology called CRISPR-Cas9. It allows people with very basic biological experience to go in and directly edit the genome of a plant, of an animal, or even of a human being. So just as I describe it like that, you can hear that with a little bit of science fictional speculation, it will have tremendous power but it will also give us uh, some real challenges. We'll have to ask how much do we want to rewrite ourselves. And with that, I'll leave it to your audience to <laughs> read about CRISPR at uh, technologyreview.com. All right, Jason Ponton, we'll leave it there. You guys do great work. Thank, Thank you, you very much for coming on theCUBE. Thanks. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Stu and I will be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live from IBM Edge. We'll be right back. <laughs>